Hey all, today I want to give a quick introduction to spatial sound and immersive audio, focusing on game sound. That said, even with game sound as our focus, it's worthwhile for us to think a little bit about immersion and what that means. After that, I'm going to quickly talk about spatializing distance manually, how we do that in a DAW or with a waveform editor. And then we'll check out building space in game audio and connect that back to these ideas of immersion. So if our goal is to make immersive audio, it's worthwhile for us to understand what makes something immersive. Of course, nowadays, immersive is a marketing term applied heavily to VR and AR. But you can just as easily be immersed in a book, immersed in literature. And of course, people get totally immersed in their devices. And these examples, especially the low-tech book example, it certainly doesn't have to rely on the technology for it to be immersive. Good place to go is Jen H. Murray's Hamlet on the Holodeck from 1997. She writes, The experience of being transported to an elaborately simulated place is pleasurable in itself, regardless of the fantasy content. We refer to this experience as immersion. Immersion is a metaphorical term derived from the physical experience of being submerged in water. We seek the same feeling from a psychologically immersive experience that we do from a plunge in the ocean or swimming pool, the sensation of being surrounded by a completely other reality, as different as water is from air, that takes over all our attention, our whole perceptual apparatus. So again, while the book isn't necessarily immersing our senses, it's taken over our perceptual apparatus. Okay, so to return to our question, what makes something immersive, maybe one answer is immersion isn't about creating a realistic experience. It's about creating this immersive world, this other place that can take over our senses. You can be immersed in Lord of the Rings, even though wizards aren't real. Put another way, let's talk about breaking immersion. Immersion isn't broken when something isn't realistic. Immersion is broken when something doesn't fit into the virtual world. You're immersed in listening to a band's recording, and then there's a wrong note that brings you out of that world. You're immersed in reading a book, but then there's a plot hole, or a character acts the way that they shouldn't act. These events that don't fit into the world are more perilous to our immersion than whether something has a reality to it or not. Okay, so then what makes audio immersive? Same idea, it's not about our audio being real, it's about our audio establishing a world. I've brought this up before, but if we think about a lot of the commercial recordings we listen to, they aren't about creating reality. For example, the piano might be stretched all across the left-right field, as opposed to being in a single place on the stage. If we're sitting in the audience, we don't hear the left hand of the piano on the left and the right hand of the piano on the right. The only person who hears that is the pianist. But then the pianist also doesn't hear the vocal right in the center. And thinking about the panning of our drums, drum sets are enormous in the stereo space in a way that no one in the room listening to that ensemble would hear them. So these recordings aren't about creating reality, they're about creating a kind of hyper-reality. Once again, I've talked about hyper-realism before, so I'll cut myself off there. But to give a quick example, think about an Instagram photo of food. The goal of that photo is not to make that food look realistic, it's about making that food look as amazing as possible. To give an example from the game world, the studio art director of Horizon Zero Dawn from 2017 says about their visuals, it's a quality that isn't actually completely photorealistic. It's a form of hyperrealism that we started calling BBC realism. It's all shot in perfect condition at the perfect time of day with exactly the right dramatic light angle, cloudscapes, and weather. There's a lot of cinematic grading to add contrast, atmosphere, and saturation to the screen. It's a film process that takes weeks to find those two conditions and film a 10-second snippet. So again, returning to audio, it doesn't matter if it's stereo, it doesn't matter if it's 3D sound and Dolby Atmos. We have license to not be real as long as we create an engaging, immersive world. To that, spatialization plays a role in this a lot of times, too. Oftentimes in a commercial recording, there are layers of different reverbs on it, which would mean that the whole ensemble are actually in different rooms, and our ears are okay with this. However, in order to be hyperrealist and not completely abstract, we need to base our hyperrealist rules in the rules of the real world, and then maybe stretch things a little bit. When we think about spatializing audio, there are three things that our ears can tell us about a sound. It can tell us the direction of the sound, the distance of the sound, and the size and shape of the space that the sound happens in. 
For now, let's just focus on distance as an example here. So how do we know when a sound is getting further away? First, and most obviously, the further away a sound is, the quieter we perceive it. Second, low frequencies travel further and high frequencies dissipate more easily, which means the further away a sound is, the more we hear the low frequencies and the less we hear the highs. Also, the sound of the reverberation is less impacted by distance than the direct sound, which means the reverberant sound shouldn't fade out as much as the direct does as the distance of the sound increases. I'm going to demonstrate this in just a sec, but this is something I believe I heard in a Scott Wyatt talk that he made his students demonstrate that they could place sounds in a matrix. Left and right is easy. We've got a knob for that that pans things to the left and right. But what's more challenging is moving something front and back. Briefly, I'll pull up a demo of this in Logic, and let's see how I did. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, two, five, eight. So again, left and right is just simple panning. But here in the front, all minus three middle, minus 9, and I have a low-pass filter on them. In the back, minus 23, and the low-pass filter is more steep. I have a bit of a high-pass filter on those two. Additionally, they're all sending this bus to the reverb, and I've sent this all pre-fader, which is why as it gets further back, the reverberant sound isn't affected at the same way that the direct sound is. Returning to this idea of the matrix, now, if you can do that with two speakers, when you move into quad arrangements, in eight-channel arrangements, and the skills you build in the stereo matrix transfer over to these larger formats. I know I just went over this logic example quickly, but I'll throw up a link to a video where I go into it in more depth. The main idea here, though, is parametric support. Parametric support is when multiple characteristics of a sound, the parameters, work together to support an expressive idea. For example, often in a song, when a singer goes to a high note, they also crescendo too. So then you have multiple parameters, how high the pitch is, and how loud it is, working together for this single expressive idea. In our distance example, we're using the reverberation, the amplitude, and the low-pass filtering together to create this expressive idea of increasing distance. Okay, this is all well and good, but games offer a different level of agency. So we need to be able to do all of this in real time and also adaptively make changes based on player decisions, where they look, what they do, etc. Here's a very simple example in Unity. There's a little radio on that cylinder there. And we can hear how this is adaptively changing as the distance and direction of the player changes. In Unity, the first step here is to think about audio sources and audio listeners. Audio listeners are what's going to hear the sound, and so these are generally placed on the camera. At the start of things, there's not much to mess with on those. But on the radio, there's also an audio source, which has a number of characteristics here. Now, we can go to the Unity documentation for more on this, but I just want to give some basic ideas that can transfer over to whatever platform and game engine you're using. First, we have the audio clip, which is the sound that we're playing. And then, significant to our perception of distance, we have a volume control here. We also have a reverb zone mix, again, in the same way that we had that send in our DAW. But significantly here, we have this spatial blend. So if I set the spatial blend to 2D, listen to what happens. Doesn't matter where I go, what I look at, the 2D is just always sending to the left and right. So in order to have Unity do some work spatializing this sound, we need to put it over into 3D. Okay, and then after that, it's making all of these decisions based off of the distance the player is for me. So here's this graph, which shows different parameters and how they change over the distance. So we can see the volume decreases as the distance increases. The low-pass filter 
cutoff frequency goes down as the distance increases, this red line being the distance here. Okay, so now, let's watch this graph as we run the game. There's some Doppler effect in there too. I might turn that down. <laughs> okay, maybe that's too far away. Maybe I, I want to not be able to hear it anymore from that distance. I can just change this max distance here to be 100 instead of 200. Okay, pretty neat. In Uni, you can create all different kinds of these curves over distance, logarithmic, linear, or custom. But once again, having multiple parameters working at the same time helps create your realism or your hyperrealism. Okay, we've been talking about the direction and the distance of the sound. Now let's talk about the size and shape of the space. Here's another quick example. This time, all of the sounds are 2D. They're all on the character, so it's footsteps and breathing sounds, but listen to what happens as we traverse the space. So in this case, there are different reverberant spaces created, moving from a very echoey space in the room, to a tighter echo in the hallway, to a more open space outside. In Uni, these are called reverb zones. And so you can see there are two circles here. One is the min distance, which as long as you're inside of it, you hear all of that reverb sound. And after you leave this min distance, it starts to fade out that reverb effect until you reach the max distance when it's silent. And so you can overlap your reverb zones as you pass from one space to another to give that impression of the different spaces. Okay, so we know about reverb, we know about creating sources. So all we need to do to create our complex immersive environment is just attach a ton of sound sources to everything, and then the result should be a hyper-realistic immersive space. Honestly, I think that's a pretty great idea. However, the issue comes down to resources. Can we use that much disk space for audio for the game? Can we use that much processing power? Maybe not, but we can cleverly create immersive soundscapes with a mix of different things. We can have an area loop that's maybe just a stereo recording that's played into the player's ears. Now, this might not be terribly immersive, but this provides the bed for the other sounds going on. So in the case of this corridor, I just record an empty corridor on a stereo mic. Then source loops I created sounds coming off of the fluorescent lights and fans. And these loops are different lengths. So maybe one is 10 seconds, one's 11. So when they loop, they don't loop at the same time, creating a constantly changing environment. And then these are placed in 3D space. Additionally, I have some sounds that are just sort of one shots. So rather than being loops, they're just single random clips that come from a space. I have a rattly pipe above the player here. <coughs> And then finally, player-oriented one-shots. The footsteps, the coughing sound. These are all 2D from the perception of the player. Again, these are all just some very basic ideas to help you start thinking about how you can make immersive environments. Remember that immersive doesn't have to mean realistic, but drawing from reality allows us to make something hyper-realistic. And then you can create an engaging audio world that your players really want to spend time in. I'm going to leave it there for today. Let me know what you come up with.